Okay, so welcome. Here we are one last time for our small engines course this summer of 2021. Uh, today we are going to jump into our last segment or module, which is all about electrical and ignition systems. We're going to look at everything um, from spark plugs to ignition coils. Um, we're going to use a few different voltmeters here. Um, and hopefully you'll get something out of that. Now, obviously, um, you know, at ARC, we spend a whole semester, in fact, multiple semesters, teaching students about uh, electrical systems uh, in our automotive program. And so we're just basically going to scratch the surface today because electrical is a very vast subject area. Um, but it is something that you do have to know about if you're going to be a small engine uh, technician. Uh, because there are more and more uh, electrical systems and electronics working into our small engines. So with that, let me get the screen share going. And I think what we're going to do first is just open up the internet here. And here is our Canvas page. Um, I've been working away on your grades. I have a few more things to update and do, so I'll keep uh, working on that uh, throughout the week. Um, so again, here we are, we're on uh, really our module five um, information here. Three, module four is governors, five, ignition systems and electrical. I did put together this bonus thing for like high performance engines. I thought you guys might be interested in some of that stuff. Um, you can't see it, but I'm wearing my Briggs and Stratton uh, racing shirt here today. Uh, I mean, they, they really do have a, a great grassroots motorsports part of uh, the company there. Um, so that's that's kind of interesting if, if you're into building engines that go fast. Um, but we're we're going to focus on um, electrical uh, today, and um, with the uh, with the electrical systems. Uh, I'm going to bounce back and forth between a couple different presentations, and we're going to look at our still, I get my annotation tools on, we're going to look at some of this uh, still uh, um, uh, presentation as well. So let's, let me switch over uh, to that. So here I am on still on their new iAcademy, and of course, for this class, this was the, the big hurdle is still had redone their training, went from Votech to I Academy, And at first it really kind of threw us for a loop. Um, but as I'm learning it, and hopefully you're learning it too, it's starting to come together. Um, so if I go to Learner Home, what I'm gonna do is type in Ignition and it should come up with the training that I want bronze seven magneto ignition operation that's what i want now i want to talk about that word magneto right you can see that the the magnet or magnetism is is built into that and by and large our small engines do use a magneto style ignition system in that we don't want to lug around a big battery on a small engine we want something that's small and light even a little battery like this one in my hand here would add uh, a considerable amount of weight uh, to the engine. In fact, let me stop my um, screen share real quick. There we go. So even a, a little battery like this, this is, weighs a couple of pounds. And if it's something handheld, that's not something I want to have, uh, you know, an extra two pounds. That's not something I want on my device. So, um, the advantage of a magneto style ignition system is I can fire my spark plug without having to lug around uh, a battery on my device. So um, what we're going to do now is I'm going to change the screen share again. Um, uh, and we're going to go into the still presentation. And we're also going to go into the Briggs and Stratton presentation that lines up with the textbook and then another one. So we're going to we're going to be kind of mowing through three different um, uh, presentations today uh, 
simultaneously, um, if you will. All right, so with that, we will get, I wanna, I wanna clean up this screen share a little bit. There we go. And um, one thing about electricity is really electricity is the movement of electrons. And if I can direct electrons uh, in, in, a, in an organized direction where I want them to go, I can get them to do some work for me. And so just real quick, the basics of all this is, um, you know, everything is made up of atoms, right? You, me, our small engines, and those atoms have protons and neutrons and orbiting around those guys, we have electrons. And so electricity is all about moving electrons from one atom to another atom. And in the process of doing that, I can get those electrons, I can put them to work for me and, and, and get stuff done. So uh, with that, um, one of the most common measurements you'll do uh, for electrical systems is voltage. So what I have right here in this picture is there's several uh, digital volt ohm meters or lots of times we'll call it a DMM for a digital multimeter. And they're measuring voltages at various points in a small engine electrical circuit. And you know what's kind of interesting, we call our, our automotive batteries, we call them a 12 volt battery but when they're fully charged, they really should read 12.6 volts. So what this image is showing is that this meter is connected to this battery on the power and the ground. And you notice that the ground side, and let me change this color, uh, the ground side or blackly, that's the negative side, goes to the chassis of the car, which would also be the chassis of a riding lawnmower for that. Um, uh, is measuring 12.6 volts right there. So let's keep moving forward here. So voltage is measured in a circuit. It's the difference between one point or another. But you know what? I'm going to put my annotation tool on here because what it really is like is pressure. In fact, I like to say Voltage is voltage is electrical pressure. Now, if you think of electricity like water in a water circuit, right? I'm not going to get any water flowing through my pipes or out my garden hose if I don't have any pressure at some point in that system. And so without any voltage, nothing's going to happen. So voltage is my electrical pressure that gets the atoms, or actually I should say more precisely, the electrons to move from atom to atom to atom to atom. So I have to have some voltage, some electrical pressure to direct those electrons and move them from atom to atom. So what is voltage? Voltage is electrical pressure. With some voltage then, I can get some electrons moving the direction I want them to move. Traditionally, we think about electrons moving from the positive post of a battery to the negative post. That's called conventional current flow theory. Um, this next slide, if I get rid of some of these drawings, is talking about current. And what is current? Well, current is just that. It's that flow of electrons. It's that flow of electrons moving through the circuit. So here, they're showing electrons moving actually from the negative post of the battery through a little light bulb, that's our load, through a switch and back to the positive end. And so the key word is that current is the flow Voltage is the pressure, current is the flow. But now we've talked about the electrons moving both from the positive post of the battery to the negative post and from the negative post to the positive post. So you might be thinking, well, what, what is it? Well, it really depends. It, it really doesn't matter 
for, for most intents and purposes, it depends on how you want to look at it. Most of our manuals are written with conventional current flow theory, which is electrons moving from the positive post to the negative post. However, if you take an electronics class and you really get into the, the nitty gritty of how electronic devices work, what you find is that, you know what, it actually goes the other way. Electrons actually flow from the negative side to the positive side. For the typical small engine, even automotive mechanic or technician, it really doesn't matter. But there is one thing on this slide that does matter and that's AC versus DC. So here we have DC here at the bottom, and it's labeled down there. We have DC and up here we have AC. Now our houses use AC or alternating current, meaning that the current goes one direction, then it turns around and goes the other direction. It's still flowing, but it's flowing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Now that back and forth movement can still turn on a light bulb and make it illuminate. Um, however, for certain things like electronic devices or to charge a battery, I need current to flow in one direction only, for instance, uh, direct current. And so that's why, like, if you think of your cell phone, if I want to charge my cell phone, I have a little power adapter, wall adapter thing I plug into my house, the, the cable, which is USB on one end, plugs into that thing, and the other end plugs into my phone. That converts the AC from my house to DC and steps the voltage down to be the right amount of electrical pressure to charge up my cell phone. Okay, so we have AC and DC. Our cars, by and large, are DC. Our houses are AC. A small engine uh, is kind of unique in that it's, you know, it's it might be a mix of some AC and some DC, which is kind of different. Uh, and a lot of my automotive students tend to struggle with this because um, we see a little bit more AC being used on small engine stuff. Now, here's a slide just talking about wire sizes. You can see that the, the numbering system for the gauge sizes of wire moves the opposite way that you might think. So a 12 gauge wire is much larger than a 22 gauge wire. It's similar to like sheet metal and those things. So the smaller the number, the thicker the wire if I'm going to run a wire a longer distance, I want to use a thicker and thicker wire so that I don't have that wire become a problem. I don't have the resistance of the wire uh, hurting me in the circuit. And that's that's how we're going to introduce our next um, topic. And that is going to be resistance. So before I get into all this mess, uh, AC sine waves and everything else, we're going to take another another uh, left turn here and we are gonna open up uh, my other Briggs and Stratton presentation um, that in some ways is not the pictures aren't as good but it's more basic and I think it spells things out maybe a little bit better so let's see if we can get that uh, set up. Okay, so we've talked about electricity. Um, we haven't, well, we're talking about wires. So obviously wires are conductors. They have good amounts of free electrons on the atoms that make up that material. Here we have insulators. Th those are things like plastic, rubber, glass. Those are insulators. Conductors would be like copper wires, uh, a steel frame, aluminum. Those allow elect electrons to pass through them very easily, where resistors don't. Those block those electrons. And that brings us up to this concept of resistance, which is where I want to go. Um, so if I keep this presentation moving forward here, we've talked about voltage the pressure, electrical pressure that causes stuff to move. 
we've talked about current flow. Now current flow is actually measured in amperes or amps. So I'm gonna use my typing tool, my, my annotation tool and write current flow. So current flow is measured in amps. And it's the actual movement or volume, that flow volume of electrons from one atom to another to another. Um, there is watts. And so if you buy a light bulb or something for your house, it might be 60 watts. Well, watts is a measurement of, of electricity where basically it's the volts times the amps. We don't use it a lot as a typical technician, but because we have electric cars now and because we have so many more like electric small outdoor power equipment things, like you might have a electric leaf blower and it's a thousand watts. I figured I would, I would add this to the thing. So, so what are watts? If I take the volts and I multiply that by, that's going to equal, so I'll put that over here. That's going to equal watts. Okay. So it's a measurement of the pressure and the current flow multiplied together. Okay. And actually it can re directly relate to horsepower. 746 watts of electricity equal one horsepower. So, um, all right, moving right along. Resistance. Resistance is measured in ohms. And you've probably seen it displayed as that Greek omega symbol. If you're familiar with this at all, you've seen a little symbol that looks like that. And I'm gonna type in what it is. If I can here, let me get this thing to work. There we go. It is the It's the opposition to current flow. So whenever I'm flowing electrons through a wire, there's always going to be some resistance to that flow, right? Some opposition to that flow. We measure that in ohms. Um, and of course, if I was trying, if I had a long distance to transmit that electricity, um, I would need a thicker wire uh, for all intents and purposes. I need a thicker wire. Otherwise, the, the, it couldn't handle all that uh, electron flow. So that's why I said earlier, hey, if I'm going to run wires around, if, if I, the longer I have to run that wire, the, the bigger the gauge size, the, the lower that number. Maybe a, a, if I only had to run it, a, you know, six inches, I might do a 22 gauge. But if I got to run it three feet, I might go down to a 12 gauge. All right. So we'll get rid of those drawings. And um, so what can affect electricity? They got this little acronym here, the length, the size, the thickness, the motion, the force, the temperature, all those things will affect electricity. So I was talking about the length of a wire or the size, right? The thickness of the conductor. But there's another thing that happens in that, you know, electricity and magnetism are directly related. And we're gonna explore that more in just a little bit. Um, temperature also affects things. And what I like to think about temperature, especially with your electronic devices, like ignition coils and modules, sometimes these things will work and they'll work for years and years and then they just stop working some, one day. Or what often happens is they work and work, work and they become heat sensitive. It starts getting hot and all of a sudden you have no spark anymore. Um, and then you let it cool and it works again for a little bit and it heats up and it stops working. So the temperature does affect things. In fact, generally speaking, the resistance of components increases as the temperature goes up. Um, and so you'll see that you'll have some components. We've seen this with ignition modules and computers and cars and uh, various sensors that they work fine at regular temperatures, 70, 80 degrees. Um, and then they get, you know, 150, 200 degrees and they stop working. All right. 
So earlier we looked at a multimeter. Here is your very basic fluke. This is like a fluke 23 multimeter. And what I like about this very basic image is it labels everything out for us what the different parts are. So we have volts AC and it shows us this little AC sine wave right here. Volts DC shows us, uh, think of it straight line from positive to negative, or it could be pulsating. So there's two little lines there. So AC volts, DC volts, it has a 300 millivolt scale. So if I'm measuring a very small amount of voltage, I will have more accuracy in my meter right there. I have a selection here where I would turn this knob around so it points towards that for ohms. This has a diode test. Um, and then I have a couple amps positions. So this is this is a digital multimeter or DMM because it measures volts, amps, and ohms. It also has a diode test feature. Um, however, a lot of times if, if somebody is, oh, if you're working with a, a mechanic who's old school, they might call it like a DVOM because the early ones could only measure volts and ohms. So they call it a DVOM. Uh, we kind of use those terms interchangeably. It's a multimeter. This one here can measure volts, amps, and ohms. When I go to measure amps, I have to move the lead over to these other spots. And you'll see that in a minute because I'll, I'll do some of that stuff. Um, so this is a very basic multimeter, but it is an auto ranging meter. Um, and it's, you know, you're, if you were gonna do a lot of small engine work, especially if you had to do some electrical diagnostics, you're gonna to need to have a, a multimeter to, to do a lot of that stuff. And a typical automotive technician will spend several hundred dollars on his or her uh, multimeter. Um, however, you could do a lot of testing with it with a $10 meter as well. And that's what I'll feature for most of our tests today. So this presentation then goes and shows us some different um, stator windings that you would see on various Briggs and Stratton small engines. There's ones that are just like a half, half a stator here with a white connector. Um, there's other ones that are, have a red connector. And there's other ones here that go all the way around. And at this point, what I need to do is kind of give you some context of what are we looking at here? And how, how do things interact with each other? So for that, I think to make it easier for me to switch back and forth, back and forth, um, we are gonna change our screen share again, but this time I'm just gonna change it to straight up the computer screen so I can switch screens very, very quickly. Okay. So for this one, I want to get to some of these. Okay, I said that uh, electricity and magnetism are very, very related. So here we have on this slide, and this is from our textbook, where it's showing pictures of it's showing pictures of magnets, and you can see their magnetic lines of flux, and um, like poles repel, opposites attract, but also over here, it says temporary magnet, where if I run electricity through a coil of wire, I will actually make magnetism around that wire. And so this temporary magnet is really what most folks would call an electro magnet. And we use those uh, all over the place. We use electromagnetism all over the place. And so the, the bottom line is this, is I can use electricity to make magnetism and I can use magnetism to make electricity. So remember, um, if I get my annotation tools back, there we go. Let's move some stuff around. 
here we were, we were cruising in the still and I said, hey, we're gonna open up this um, uh, Magneto presentation. Well, guess what? I've already done it, here it is. Um, what still has done with their latest updates as they went from the Votech to the iAcademy is they integrated it in some of these video clips. And sometimes it's a pain I find because you gotta watch the whole little video to advance the next slide. But I thought this one was pretty cool. So here we have, we have a, a coil of wire. You just took a, a little piece of wire, you wrapped it around this plastic tube, you know, probably several hundred times. We've hooked it up to a, uh, a voltmeter there, an analog voltmeter. And uh, he's gonna start sending a, uh, a bar magnet through that tube. And when he does that, you'll see the voltmeter change. Um, now, if you just put a piece of metal in the core, the piece of metal doesn't change anything, but look at what that did. Is that that amplified the voltage generated by having the iron core in there. Now he's taking a flywheel off of a, a small engine that has a magnet in it. He put it on a drill and he's holding it over that coil of wire. And you can see as that flywheel rotated, it again made pulsating voltage spikes on that meter, okay? So I can use magnetism to create electricity, create electrical pressure. Um, and and that, I thought that was a pretty neat little video clip there. So then they set up this little animation and this is what you'd set up on a small engine. This is our magneto ignition system. I have a magnet, it's in the flywheel. As the flywheel rotates around, it generates a voltage in the windings of the coil, the ignition coil right there. Remember, whenever I, um, ex whenever I run a, uh, electrical current through a wire, it makes a magnetic field, that's an electromagnet. And whenever I expose some wires to a changing magnetic field, I'll, I'll induce voltage in those windings. And of course, if I have some voltage, some electrical pressure, I can get some current flow out of that. So uh, that's what we play around with all over the time, all over the place on our cars and on our um, uh, various uh, electrical devices that uh, on cars and small engines. So here is an ignition coil taken apart. And what you can see in there is that there are two windings a primary winding and a secondary winding. And so what I'm going to, to try to try to do for you guys is, is draw out, I'm gonna draw out an old school coil. And the old school coils like you'd find on a car were kind of cylindrical in shape. They'd have a top part, they'd have a, a cap that go around like that. And then the rest of the tube, here it is right here. Not the best drawing, but I'm doing it with my computer mouse so you get the idea. And it's going to have a couple terminals on the top for my primary winding, and it's got this lead in the center for my secondary winding. How is it actually wired up on the inside? Well, the primary winding is going to connect from positive to negative. So it's going to be a bunch of turns of wire. My drawing's not doing it justice. But let's say that's 200 little turns of wire in there. And that's this. Now, around all that stuff, well, actually in the center of this, I'm gonna have some type of an iron core. I'll draw that right here. So there's my iron core. There's my laminated steel core on this ignition coil. Um, and then I'm going to have my secondary winding. And my secondary winding is going to be a whole bunch of turns of really, really fine wire. And it's going to be in the neighborhood of, let's say, 10 to 20,000 turns of wire in here. Whole lot more wires, little wires there on the, on the secondary than there is in the primary. And how is he wired up? Well, he's got one lead going there and one lead going out the center where the spark plug wire comes out. So the secondary winding 
connects to this lead right here, which goes to my spark plug. And how this works is I send electricity through the coil. As I send the elect electricity th through, it creates a magnetic field, right? Electromagnetism. When I stop that electricity, that magnetic field collapses it cuts across all these windings and it generates a high amount of voltage, a high amount of electrical pressure in the neighborhood of 10 to maybe 15,000 volts on a small engine to maybe 20, 30, 40, 50, 60,000 volts for an automotive ignition. Uh, and that's enough voltage to get electricity to jump the gap of a spark plug. So when you look at an ignition coil, basically what that coil is, coil, it's a step up, step up transformer, in that it takes the little bit of voltage coming in, if it was an automotive ignition system, to take the 12 volts coming in and it steps it up to 20,000 volts or more. On a small engine, it takes a little bit of voltage that's generated from this flywheel magnet, and it steps that up to be thousands of volts to fire a spark plug. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense to you. What I'm gonna do is um, move to the next slide here. And what we can see is uh, here's our primary winding. Here's our secondary winding. This uh, weird little thing right here basically represents our spark plug gap. So we'll clear that out. And um, we can see there's a magnet pressed in the flywheel. And as the flywheel spins around, that magnet is going to cause a changing magnetic field to rotate around that ignition coil. And so, what we have to do then is be able to trigger it at exactly the same, at exactly the right time in the two stroke cycle or the four stroke cycle. So that's what we've done with this little switch right here. And if I rotate this thing around, I will generate a spark at precisely the right time. Let's see if I can find, there it is. So you can see that guy's rotating around. As he rotates around, it charges up the coil, the little switch switches, and it generates a spark at the spark plug. So again, the coils, the flywheel's rotating, the magnetics rotate, the magnets rotating around on the flywheel. As it gets close to the coil, it generates a magnetic, it, it has a magnetic field that changes around the wires that generates an electrical pressure in the wires, we trigger it to collapse by opening up the uh, little transistor there. That magnetic field collapses inside the coil and it generates a high amount of voltage to fire the spark plug. So it's, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff happening inside this ignition coil. In fact, especially on a steel engine, if I get back, to this ignition coil, we look at it and we think, oh, that's just an ignition coil. But actually it's an ignition coil on a little computer chip board right here. And so you can see some electronics right here and a transistor. So it's your coil and your points and condenser if you're an old school automotive guy or your ignition module, it's basically all built into one, okay? On, on a typical small engine. On a motorcycle or something, you're likely to have an ignition coil as a separate part. And then you're gonna have a CDI box, stands for capacitive discharge ignition, but you're basically gonna have this box that controls when the coil fires, okay? And you might even have like a pickup. So I have this pickup that's spinning with the engine. I'll put a PK there for pickup. It triggers the CDI box. And then the CDI box sends that information to the coil. On a small engine like this little still, maybe this is a chainsaw or something, it's kind of all in the, in the same little 
unit that basically looks like an ignition coil. So with that, it makes the diagnostics considerably easier. You know, I always would check for spark. If I don't have spark, then I'm gonna make sure that the ignition switch, the on off switch isn't like grounded or something. And if it's not that, and my, the magnet didn't fall out of my flywheel, it's probably a defective ignition coil slash module unit. Now, uh, let me come back to that slide. Here is some of the electronics that you would see inside of a steel ignition coil, especially in one of their high end um, engines where it actually has some spark advance. So let's, let's tie all this back together now to our four stroke cycle. Remember that's intake, compression, then we get power and exhaust. Intake, compression, power, exhaust. Well, in this four stroke cycle, I'm going to want my spark to happen towards the end of the compression stroke, right? And it's that spark that helps start the air fuel mixture burning, which then leads me to my power stroke. We usually want this spark to happen oh, a few degrees before top dead center of the compression stroke. So I'm gonna write over here 10, degrees, 10 degrees what? 10 degrees before top dead center, the TDC. Um, as the engine changes its speed, it might make me more power to maybe have, have that spark happen at the spark plug even sooner. So maybe at a thousand RPM, I want it to happen at 10 degrees before top dead center. At 3000 RPM, I might want it to happen uh, 15 or 20 degrees before top dead center. A low end small engine is not gonna do that. It's not gonna provide you any ignition advance, but a high end small engine like this that would have this still set up or something like a motorcycle or a jet ski or a quad, um, something that's more high end, something that's more complicated, it's going to have some more electronics in here that are going to give you spark advance. And what spark advance? Spark advance is getting, get too many T's in there. No, I guess there's two T's. It looks weird in all caps. Getting the spark In the four stroke cycle. The, the idea is that at higher RPM, there's less time to burn the air fuel mixture. So I got to start that process sooner. I got to advance the ignition timing. So I might be, you know, at five degrees before top dead center, but at high speeds, I might be at 25 degrees before top dead center of when do I get the spark to the spark plug in the four stroke cycle or in the two stroke cycle for that matter, since this is small engine class. Um, and on high-end products, I'm going to have some electronics in there to help me do that. So now if I go back to the previous slide and I get rid of my crazy drawings, what this image here is showing us is that at higher speeds on the high-end products with better designed ignition systems, they actually give us a variable advance curve where we start off with a low amount of advance. Here's my degrees of advance. So I'm at degrees before top dead center. So here I get it started. I'm at, you know, I don't know, 10, 12 degrees before top dead center. That gets me up to about 18 degrees before top dead center for the variety of my running, which is gonna give me better acceleration, lower fuel consumption, um, this lower amount of ignition advance gives me easier starting. 
And then I'm going to give myself some more advance here to give me better power and torque output at higher speeds. And so if I generally set up a ger generic curve, it would be something like this. Hmm, kind of ugly, but where I would have um, a lot of advance at high speeds. And then as I went to real high speeds and real high loads, I'd kind of back off that advance a little bit, okay? That's pretty high end. In fact, one of the classes that I teach is automotive engine tuning. Uh, it's the AT325 class. And we spend a lot of time figuring out the best advance curve for an engine. And you can unlock a lot of power by getting this advance curve just you know, perfectly dialed in. Um, that being said, a lot of your small engines, hey, it's the, you know, I bought the whole mower for 300 bucks or whatever, right? So a lot of those small engines will just have a fixed ignition timing somewhere right here that allows it to start up okay and make okay power. Or maybe it's down right here where it starts up pretty decent and makes okay power. Is it ideal? No, but it's kind of a fixed compromise. And so for like a Briggs and Stratton engine, B and S, that's for the most part, the majority of their engines will have a fixed ignition timing in their ignition system. And that will fire the spark plug at always the same time in the ignition, uh, in the in the four stroke cycle. So anyways, that's what this slide is showing. I, I thought I wanted, uh, you know, I wanted to give it some context here because uh, if you were just looking through it, it might not make a whole lot of sense, okay? But it's all about it, when do I fire the spark plug in the four stroke cycle? Okay, um, we've gone over a little bit of how I can use magnetism to make electricity. I can use electricity to make magnetism and I can go back and forth between those two and I can step my voltages up, I can bring them down, all that type of stuff um, by messing around with magnetism and electricity. Okay, let's keep this thing moving right along. So we saw that. And then here's that graphic again. So this stuff in the middle, if I clear up those drawings, this represents the electronics on the inside to control exactly when do I fire the spark plug. So it's, it's kind of like the magnet in the, co the, the primary and secondary windings of the coil, like, um, you know, the coil gets charged up, if you will, from that, uh, from that magnetism. But the electronics control when the magnetic field that's going through the primary and secondary windings collapses, and that's what controls when the spark plug fires. All right. And I know, I mean, we're scratching the surface, so I know it, it may not make a ton of sense to you. Um, fortunately for us, like as a small engine technician, let's let's just break this down. Like, what do I really have to worry about? Maybe maybe I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around how the electronics of this thing work. Don't worry about it. What would I have to do as far as figuring stuff out? Like, if I had no spark, right? Well, one, you know, I check for spark, right? If I check for spark, and I have I end up with no spark. Well, then what's my next step gonna be? Well, uh, my second thing I would wanna do is check the kill wire. My third thing is maybe I I should um, I shouldn't have like a 1.5 here. Okay, let me 
so it's a little bit with it over the yellow is a little weird but anyways um so here's here's what i got going on here like Here's my ignition system. There's not a lot to it here. There really is just not much there. So there is gonna be a wire going to this terminal right here. And guess what that wire does is it goes to a kill switch, which goes to ground or the metal parts of the engine. So what would happen if I check for spark? And guess what? I'm not getting a spark right here at the spark plug like I'm supposed to. Well, you know what? An easy thing to do is throw on a new spark plug, right? Just throw a new plug in there, see what happens. So that's why I threw this kind of this, this 1.5 in here. Hey, throw a new plug in there. Okay, let's say I've done that. I still don't have spark. Well, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check the kill wire here because what happens is as this thing's running i generate this electricity in there right you can see it from the graphic if i pause it Let's see if i can pause it well if i close this wire the power that's generated here will just go straight to ground and guess what i won't get any spark at the coil that's how i shut off my engine when i turn it to off I'm closing this switch and I'm grounding out this ignition system. So I'm gonna check my, my kill wire to make sure that it's not shorting to ground all the time. I'm gonna make sure it's open. In fact, what I'll do sometimes is I'll just disconnect it from the kill switch. I'll make sure it's not hooked up. So now I've like removed the kill wire and I'll see, does it have spark? If it has spark now, then I found my problem. But if it still doesn't have spark, well, then I'm gonna look at the flywheel. And I'll look at this flywheel and I'm gonna say like, well, does the magnet have magnetism? Yeah, it does, okay. Is it coated with a bunch of crud? Or is there too big of a gap between the flywheel and the magnet? Uh, uh, not between the flywheel and the magnet, but between the magnet that's in the flywheel and my ignition coil. I don't want too big of a gap between those two components. In fact, what Briggs says is to use a microfish card, which basically, you know, if you took like um, uh, a thick envelope and folded it in half uh, and stuck it between the two, that would work. You want somewhere around, let's say 20 thousandths of an inch between those two, which would be like, um, I don't know, the thickness of Average piece of paper is two thousandths. So maybe, uh, you know, eight to 10 sheets of uh, binder paper uh, would work. You want it to be a pretty small gap so that the magnetism can really, you know, influence the windings of the coil. So I make sure the gap's not too big. There's not a bunch of crud on there, um, that the magnet is strong in the flywheel. And if I've done all that, well, what the only thing left is my coil i throw a new coil on there and see if that fixed it so the nice thing about this is a lot of fancy complicated things going on inside the coil but it's all you know it's all about that one uh unit that like this is all within the coil i guess not that part let's get rid of this um all right so let's get rid of these drawings Hopefully we've kind of given you some insight on how the ignition system works. Um, and that's what you would have on a still product. You know, it's gonna be a chainsaw, a string trimmer, um, pretty basic stuff. Uh, we've talked about spark plugs a little bit last week. We looked at the insides. Remember that the, the top part is the ceramic. It's an insulator. It's all about trying to get that 10,000 volts down to the ground electrodes here at the bottom so that we can have the spark happen down here in our combustion chamber. But there is a lot of technology here, uh, like the gap's gotta be the right gap. If I drop this thing on the ground and this gap gets closed up, then it's not gonna make a spark. Uh, the threads have to be the right ones for the cylinder, right? They have to reach in there the, the right distance. They can't go in there too far. I've seen people put in the wrong spark plug 
and then they beat a hole in their piston top because it's hitting the electrodes. Um, and, you know, there should be a gasket on here on your typical small engine plug. Some automotive engines use like a tapered seat, but um, what I would say is when in doubt, throw a nice fresh spark plug in that's the correct heat range, the correct application, so you can eliminate that variable. Because uh, there is a lot there and it's and it's in a, it's placed in a pretty hot environment and we already talked about the heat ranges last week, so I won't kill you with that. Um, so here is that ignition module testing procedure that I kind of went over on myself and kind of wrote out my own ignition test myself where I says check for spark, um, that type of thing. So this one uh, is Stills factory procedure where they say, all right, well, make sure the switch is in the run position, look at the spark plug to determine how the engine was running, check the spark plug boot, test with ZAT3 or ZAT4, that's their little ignition system tester. So if I look at this image here, what I have right here is a little tool that they put in place in between the ignition coil and the spark plug. And what it does is it lights up whenever there's spark there. So you put it kind of in line or in series here, you pull the rope here and this thing will go flash, 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 flash if you have spark. So they're basically saying, hey, put your little spark tester in there. Do you have good spark? Well, yes, you do. Well, then the engine should run, right? Um, do you not have good spark? Okay, check the things like the flywheel gap, that type of stuff that I talked about before. Um, uh, you know, look for the wires grounded to the kill switch. So you can see it's a pretty easy diagnostic flow chart on an engine like this. Okay. Um, and that brings us to that summary there. I'm gonna close that thing out. And I'm gonna minimize that and get our uh, Briggs presentation back up because we're not quite done with electrical yet. So hopefully at this point we get how, hey, we can use magnetism to make electricity and we can use electricity to make magnetism and kind of go back and forth between those two things. Well, if I have, let's say a riding lawnmower or a bigger piece of equipment where I'm gonna have a battery on that piece of equipment, I need to charge that battery. I might have lights and stuff that I need to run or gauges. And so that would require me to have some type of a charging system. And so what you would have on a bigger engine in a, you know, a piece of outdoor power equipment is some type of charging system. So look at this flywheel. <clears throat> This flywheel not only has magnets in it, that would be for the ignition system on the outside, but it's got magnets here on the inside of the flywheel with these north and south poles. Now these flywheel magnets on the inside interact with coils of wire around this piece right here called the stator assembly. And basically, this is your charging system on a small engine. On a car, we talk about the alternator. The alternator on my car is out. It's not charging my battery. Now, why do we call it an alternator? Well, it actually makes AC on the inside. So that's why it's an alternator. Way back when we used generators and those made DC. But instead of an alternator or a generator like you might have on a car, a small engine does has to do that same thing. It kind of uses different parts. It basically it has to do the same thing, but we want to do it for a lot less cost. We want to do it in a smaller package. And so we put magnets on the inside of the flywheel. We put this piece called a stator assembly in there and it's a bunch of coils of wire. And it can be wired up a variety of ways to do different things that I want to do namely run lights, charge a battery, this type of thing. So with that, um, uh, it's getting into some diodes and stuff, but so with that, I'm gonna produce some voltage and there's different ways I can wire that up 
And so to really show us, well, how could this thing be wired up? That's what this presentation is all about. So if I wanted to make something super cheap, what I could do is not even make a full stator. I could make like half of a stator and I could just have one wire coming off the side. And what this would be is a charging system that is AC only. Why? Because as the magnets go by the flywheel, what would happen is I would generate power in one direction as the North Pole goes by, I generate electricity in the other direction as the South Pole goes by. If I put an oscilloscope on it, what I would see is, if I get my drawing tool back, is the voltage going positive, negative, positive, negative. And that means it's gonna send electrons one way, then the other, that's AC only. Well, guess what? Light bulbs, light bulbs don't care if the electricity mo moving through them, if the current is AC or DC, they will illuminate. So if all I had to do was run some lights, this little AC only charging system would work just fine. And so that's kind of a trip for most automotive mechanics because a car has so many devices that need DC that we, we the car is going to be DC. However, if I have a small engine, it's got a magneto ignition system and I, all I want to do is run some lights, I can make a really, really cheap charging system to do that and have it be AC only. Now, uh, what if I wanted to get a little bit more sophisticated? Well, I could use a different color wire here. And what they do is they put a diode. So they put this device called a diode right in the end of this wire. And think of it as a one-way electrical check valve. It's gonna elect let electricity go out this direction, but it's gonna slam closed and not let it go back the other direction. So what would that look like? That would look like this. Electricity goes out. It charges a battery because batteries are direct current devices only. Batteries, electrons are always, you know, they're gonna go from positive to negative. So I need to charge the battery. So I gotta be DC only. So I take that same coil of wire I had before, I threw a diode on it and I made it a pulsating DC only where I chopped off the bottom half of this thing with that diode in there. There's the electrical schematic symbol for a diode. Think of it as a one-way electrical check valve. And that would enable this little charging system to charge a little battery. And that might work for that application. Remember, it's a small engine. I want to make it as inexpensive as possible. Uh, so it has a low price point. Well, maybe I got something a little more sophisticated. Maybe I got a riding lawnmower and it's got some headlights on it. They don't care if it's AC or DC. So I'll run the headlights AC, but I'll charge the battery DC. And so I got a little combo deal here. And so that would be this charging system where I got the DC half charge in the battery. I got the AC half running the headlights. That might work, work well for a particular application. But, you know, maybe I got something more sophisticated. So you can see that as I get more sophisticated, I have more things going on. Either I have a set of two diodes or I have a little rectifier regulator box and I can change the number of magnets in my flywheel to put out more amps or less, right? I can add more magnets. Now I'm up to nine amps, less magnets. I'm at five amps and this little box basically is my voltage regulator that can precisely control what that output's gonna be. And so my, you know, as my engine gets more expensive, as its application requires more, I end up with a more sophisticated charging system that gets, you know, more and more like a car's system with every step, if you will. So I have this little box and it's my voltage regulator and it's gonna be, you know, screwed to the, you know, engine or the one of the side paddles or something somewhere, and it's going to regulate how many volts comes out of this thing. Um, so I don't overcharge the battery, but I do keep the battery charged and I run all my electrical components. Now that little box thing 
is typically going to be built into the alternator of a car. So if you're looking at your car and like, well, you know, but really old cars had a voltage regulator that was external. It was a little metal box. And then really new cars, they actually let the, the computer that controls the car, the engine control module usually take care of this function. All right, so different styles of charging systems for different applications. The idea is that they're gonna fine tune what charging system is on what engine based on what that engine is gonna go on to again, make the price point of this engine package as inexpensive as possible. There's the flywheel magnets inside the flywheel. Here we can have a more elaborate charging system. Um, but I think at this point you get the idea. So what is different here is that you're gonna see lots more cases on a small engine charging system where I might have some AC circuits um, rather than everything be co being converted DC like it would typically be on a car. Okay, there's some things on this drawing like that's a Zener diode for voltage regulation. Um, we won't get into a whole bunch of that because again, we're just scratching the surface, but you can see as I move up in complexity and I put out more power I end up with a more sophisticated charging system, more sophisticated voltage regulator on there. Uh, it says regulator slash rectifier. The rectifier is converting AC to DC. The regulator is making sure the voltage is not too high for the battery. A typical charging system voltage for whether it's a car or a small engine like a riding lawnmower that still uses a 12 volt battery is when it's running, I want to see uh, somewhere between 13.8 to maybe 14.8 volts when it's running because that's the charging system charging that 12 volt battery. A fully charged 12 volt battery is really going to be, if you, if you measure the voltage on a battery and it's sitting there at 12, it's actually at 50% state of charge. All right, so what I wanted to do to kind of um, uh, wrap this up, and I'm gonna go ahead and close this one out, um, is uh, we'll, uh, you know, just make sure we didn't miss anything. This slide here talks about how, how the diodes work. Um, you know, the diodes are your basic electronic component. Um, and again, basically they're a one-way electrical check valve. Um, there's different types of material in there, semiconductor material. I'm not going to uh, bore you guys with that. I, you know, if you're a, a electronics head like me, it's probably pretty interesting, but it's not something this typical small engine uh, mechanic has to know. As long as you realize that it lets the electricity flow in one direction only, that's good to know. So. Uh, you know, let's let's relate this to to again our cell phone charger because we're probably all pretty familiar with that. So I have my wall plug here. Um, let's see if I can draw it out here. Here it is here's my wall plug, and I plug in my cell phone charger. Now my cell phone charger, it's a little box. It plugs into the wall. Remember, in the wall, it has AC alternating current in this little box, what it actually has is it's going to have a diode. Why does it have a diode? Well, because the battery in my cell phone is DC. So I can't have AC go into that phone. I got to convert it to DC. So I use a diode to make it from AC to DC. Um, it's also going to have, uh, you know, some type of step down transformer type thing because my typical cell phone, he's running at 3.7 volts. Um, so maybe he's charging at, let's say, four volts. Well, I have 120 volts in my wall plug, somewhere between usually 110 to 120 volts from my wall outlet. So it's, I got to step the voltage way down. I got to go from 120 down to four, and I got to convert it from AC to DC. That's everything that this little box does, okay? It's a rectifier, and it's also a step-down transformer, if you will, to... Uh, you know, make it a lower power level, lower voltage level for my cell phone. All right. And so part of what makes that thing work is diodes in it. So we use diodes quite a bit when we're rectifying AC 
into DC. So here's a couple different charging systems. We've already gone over that. We can see the uh, AC sine wave converted to a pulsating DC. Um, again, regulator. There's a couple questions on the Briggs and Stratton power portable that shows you that little metal box and it says, what is this thing? Well, that's your regulator rectifier assembly. Uh, and here's some different um, uh, checks to see if that thing is charging uh, correctly. Um, don't forget that, you know, if I have a small engine that has a battery, you know, don't overlook the battery. Um, I will say that, uh, you know, most battery manufacturers are making their batteries sealed and they really don't want you taking the caps off and checking them with the hydrometer anymore. So what I'm going to do with this picture is I'm going to put the big cross over it. Don't do that anymore. Check its voltage with a voltmeter, charge it up, see if it stores voltage or better yet, charge it with the actual battery tester to determine if you have a, a good battery or one that's failing. Or even if it's a battery on a small engine like this, you could take it off your engine. You could take it to your local auto parts store, whether that's O'Reilly's or AutoZone or whoever, and they'll usually give you a free battery test where they'll hook it up to their uh, tester and it can measure the internal resistance of the battery and tell you if it's okay. What I would recommend you do is try to charge that battery before you take it down so that you get accurate results from their test. Obviously, you're always looking for things like corrosion. Batteries are a mixture of lead plates and sulfuric acid. And so uh, they like to corrode stuff. So I've fixed a lot of cars and some small engines in my day by just cleaning up these battery terminals. So I reduced the resistance of my electrical connections. On cars with computer controls, I mean, this can drive the computers nuts. So get all that stuff out, off of there. Uh, a good mixture that works well is baking soda and water. Mix those two together, make it like the consistency of toothpaste, slather it on there and let it go to work. A lot of people will talk about, you know, putting Coca-Cola on there that does remove the corrosion. It also makes a big sticky mess and it does not neutralize the acid. So baking soda and water is preferred. You can also use a wire brush. Uh, remember to, to clean all that stuff out of there that corrosive material is going to eat your paint. It's going to put holes in your clothes. So always be sure to clean stuff really well and wash your hands if you're working with stuff like this. They make some battery corrosion sprays that you can get at your local auto parts store, which also work really well for cleaning up stuff like this. But that's a, that's a potential problem. If it's not a problem today, it'll be a problem tomorrow. So that's something that if you do an inspection on an engine or your car or you see that there, you, you really do want to get that stuff cleaned up because it can really, it can make it not start. It can make it run and surge. It could do all kinds of stuff. Um, we've talked about flywheel magnets. Here's checking the spark plug gap. Uh, the one thing I would say, like the typical, I, I want to say this is a Briggs and Stratton question too. What's the typical spark plug gap on a Briggs engine? There it is right there, 30 thousandths. Now, where a car might have a 50 or 60,000 spark plug gap, a car has a much higher output ignition system that's not just relying on magnets and a flywheel. And so I can run a bigger spark plug gap. A small engine, I can't run a big gap like that. So still, they might have an, a gap that's down, you know, 25 thousandths. The standard gap for Briggs and Stratton engines is 30 thousandths, but you're not going to see the big gaps that you would see on car engines because a small engine ignition system cannot put out as much power. Um, one other thing I would say, let's say you're working on your car and it's got like double platinum plugs on there. Do not use one of these gapper tools because it will chip off the platinum pieces. So um, what you'll find is if you ever buy platinum plugs, they'll come with little tubes over the uh, spark plug electrodes. And that means that those plugs are pre-gapped. I just look at the gaps to make sure that Somebody didn't drop the plug or something that the gap looks correct. Okay, so he's talking about spark plug gaps. Old ignition systems on, on uh, our cars and on our small engines used to use points. So for Briggs and Stratton, the cutoff point was, I wanna say 1982, 
is when they moved away from breaker points and they moved to electronic ignition. Uh, on our cars, we moved away from breaker points in the 1970s, moving over to electronic ignitions in the late 70s. Motorcycles, again, 70s up to early 80s would be points. And then as we went into the 80s, we moved over to electronic ignition. Okay. Everything today is going to be electronic ignition. We're going to get rid of those mechanical points and condenser assembly in there. Um, so here's what you can see on Briggs and Stratton. We went from the stationary points. This is like pre-1982 at the top. And then after that, we went to our magnetron ignition system. Think of this as electronic ignition. And as we get into newer stuff, we're in this later magnetron where it's all, everything, all the magic is built into the coil here, basically, which honestly makes the diagnosis and adjustments and stuff for us easier. The problem with breaker points is as the points actually wore down, it would change when the ignition coil was fired that would change how the engine runs. That would also change the emissions coming out of the tailpipe of that engine. So why was the big push to get rid of breaker point ignition systems and move to electronic? Uh, really, it comes down to a, a, a drivability and an emissions thing. Um, the car runs better, the engine runs better for longer, and the emissions stand compliance for longer with electronic ignition. So as our smog rules and stuff came in there, we, we got rid of these breaker points and we went to electronic. Okay, you can notice that the, the gap here is, is tight on the tops of these coil lamination stacks. Um, standard magnetron, there's the parts on the inside. You can see some of the electronics in there. Primary, secondary, we talked about that type of stuff. Um, most Briggs and Stratton engines do not give you any spark advance. However, they have a few that do on their high end engines. And how you can tell them is that the air gap is wider on the coils that have some additional electronics in there to advance the ignition timing like you would have on the still products. And I want to say that is one of those test questions that's kind of specific in there that you'll have to have to take. So if you see the wide gap, if you see maybe the, the identifying band on there, that purple band, that's going to be the advancing style ignition system. Gives you a little bit more performance and a little bit easier starting on that engine. Makes it a little bit more car-like, if you will. Um, there's a few slides on starting systems. Obviously, if I, have a, if I have an engine with an electric starter, it's going to have to have a 12-volt battery on it. It's going to have to have a charging system on it. Um, the one thing I'll point out on this slide is that these are brushed motors. And so the brushes in the motor eventually wear out and fail. Also, the starter drive hammers the teeth of the flywheel. This thing will wear out over time. Sometimes we'll call this the Bendix drive. Uh, that was a certain style of, of starter drive. So the starter drives will wear out. The brushes will wear out. It's not uncommon to have to change a starter, whether it's on your car or a small engine that uses an electric start like this, if it's got a lot of starts on it, a lot of time on it, they do eventually wear out. If I have a good battery on the engine, if I have good cables, if I have clean connections, if in the uh, ignition switch and stuff is solid and I'm getting a full 12 volts to this starter as I crank over the engine, if it's not cranking, I'm looking to replace the starter. There's an automotive style starter, uh, which you might find on a real big uh, piece of equipment, something like that. Starter drive. Uh, there are some types of safety things, right? On a lawnmower, I got to hold the handle down. Otherwise, it'll ground out the ignition system. On a riding tractor, there's a switch underneath the seat that if I jump off the seat, it grounds the ignition system. So that's something that could fail. And now you have no spark because it's grounding out the ignition system. So there are other things to uh, to look for, okay? Obviously you have an ignition switch like on a riding tractor um, that we run some current through that. So that could be a failure point as well. Um, cutting blade attachments. So um, again, if you're gonna be diagnosing this stuff, you're gonna wanna have a multimeter. And what I wanna 
uh, wrap up our session with is actually doing some checks with our meter. So I'm going to turn this on the document camera. And what you guys can see here is that I have all kinds of different stuff here. I have, um, oh, here's a battery out of a Ryobi tool. It says 18 volt. It's just a battery for us to test. Here is another, this is a 12 volt style little uh, AGM absorbed glass mat battery. I have a classic automotive ignition coil here. Uh, this one was not producing sparks, so we'll test that out. And then I have a small engine ignition system here to see if we can test anything out on that as well. So with that, I have a little meter here. Um, that's a, I, I like this meter. It's got good insulation. It's got a decent cat rating, which means it's got pretty decent safety. So I wouldn't be afraid to plug this into a wall outlet and test it if I wanted to. So it's cat one to 600 volts, cat three to 300 volts. Um, uh, where like the Harbor Freight meter, that's less than $10. That's not gonna have any cat rating. Here would be an example of an automotive meter. Now this is one by Snap-on or Bluepoint, but this would be a $400 meter. But what's the difference between these two? Well, this one can do more stuff. It has more features. It can measure temperature. It can measure engine RPM, duty cycle. It can measure more stuff. It's also auto ranging. What does that mean? Well, try to zoom in on this guy. This one, if I wanna measure volts, let's say I wanna measure volts DC. I have to know how many volts do I wanna measure? Do I wanna measure something up to 2000 millivolts or do I want to measure something that's up to 20 volts or up to 200 volts or up to 500 volts for, for this one all I have to do is set him over to volts and he will automatically select the right voltage range for my measurement so uh, let me show you an example here I have this Ryobi battery I'm pretty sure I charged it I can see I got my positive and negative terminals. I'm gonna measure its voltage. And I'm assuming it should be 18 volts because that's what it says if it is fully charged. And look at that, that thing is fully charged and it's actually sitting above 18 volts right now. It's sitting at 23 volts. Now, if I take that same battery and I hook it up to this meter it's going to give me some weird information unless I understand what I am doing. I put my leads in there. Calm lead is my black lead there. And I hook it up and it says, what? OL, out of limits. So I have to select the voltage range that I actually measure the right amount of what I'm doing. There. Oh, I put it up to 20. It's still... It's still OL because it was like 23. So see how like if I didn't understand what I was doing, I could be thrown off. So 20.4 volts. I had to go to the 200 volt range to measure that. So I have to manually select the right range. I have to kind of know a little bit more to test because my meter is not as smart. So that means me as the operator, I have to be smarter. Now I'm going to hook up to this battery, which I think is pretty dead. 1.9 volts. Let me move down a scale. All right. So this thing's pretty darn dead. It's sitting at two volts. This battery's dead. It really, I'm not going to be able to bring it back from two volts. It's supposed to have 12.6 volts. Um, again, so I, I had to select the right range to get that measurement. If I select the wrong range, it will still give me out of limit. So that's the, that's the advantage of an auto ranging meter. Is it kind of, oh, as long as I know I'm measuring volts, it will get me in the right spot. Now, there's a couple of other things I might want to do. I might want to measure the resistance of some wires.
So if I wanted to test my little jumper wire here and I wanted to see, does he have a low amount of resistance? I'm gonna hook up one lead here. I'm gonna hook up one lead over there. And he doesn't measure any resistance at all. Let me see if I can move this down to a finer scale. Very, very little resistance. Again, the auto ranging meter would automatically select the range I want. I'm going to bring that meter into play here. The other thing I like about this guy oh, maybe I won't bring him into play because I think this meter might have batteries that are failing, right? You got to have good batteries in your meter. The other thing I like about this though is I can put an alligator clip on the lead and that makes it easier to me measure things. I'm gonna cheat. I'm gonna steal his leads and I'll use these nice leads on the inexpensive meter. See if that will work. This meter I got off of Amazon and it's less than, well, maybe, maybe it's just over $10. I was gonna say it's less than $10. I think it's like $12 actually. Okay, so now I'll go back here. I'm going to hook the two leads together and make sure I got a good connection. Looks like I do. Let's resistance measure some stuff. So for instance, here's an ignition coil. How we said there's a primary and secondary winding in here. The primary should be across those two terminals. In fact, the specification is less than three ohms. So if I hook this up, I should have less than three ohms. Looks like I got a lot less than that. I'm going to move this thing down. Oh, I have 1. 1. 1.6 ohms, 1.5 ohms on the primary winding of this coil. Well, there's a secondary winding. The specification for that secondary winding should be between 5 to 15,000 ohms. So now I got to just touch this probe on the inside. And I'm going to have to select the right range. Hmm. 9.82. So I was told that this coil was defective, but I'll tell you what, it sure measures out good. Do I get my pins in there again? I got 9,810 9, ohms on the secondary. I have 1.6 ohms on the primary. It's resistance readings test out. Now, every once in a while, you know something that resistance wise, it tests fine, but then when you actually go to use it, it doesn't work. But I would definitely put this back on a motor and see if it makes spark because that thing tests out perfectly. Um, here's my small engine ignition coil. Remember that it's not just a coil, but there's some electronics in here to make that coil fire. This is my, my ground wire here. If I ground this wire, I, I kill the engine. Um, I should have no continuity between this wire and ground normally. Oh, look at that. Oh, no, wait, now no, on this one, I, I am going to have continuity. And if I ground this, that's how I kill the spark. So that's right. And then let's see if I get anything on the secondary side. Which I might not on this. Nothing there. That seems right. Let's see if there's anything else good. I'm, I'm suspect of that, but I would really need to look up the testing procedure. So, you, you know, there's a lot I can test and do by measuring volts and amps. I can make sure that my spark plug has continuity on the inside of it. I've got to select the right range. Um, there, there's a lot. There's a lot I can do there. Oh, I know why I was getting a weird 
reading on the secondary, I had selected the wrong range. So there we go there. Um, yep. There we go. So 10, almost 11,000 ohms on the secondary, a few ohms on the primary, that thing actually tested out pretty good. So again, you can see how a manual ranging meter, it can trick you if you're not on the correct range. Um, but you can, uh, we basically bench tested some components. We measured some voltages. This is a 12 volt battery. It should measure a full 12.6 volts if it's fully charged. I got one other battery. I'm gonna bring this guy up again. He's another gel cell. So I'm gonna bring him up on the screen here. Now he's been sitting below my bench top for six months. So he's probably a little low on charge. Let's see where he's at. I'm gonna throw this guy over the volts. I'm gonna to go to a 20 volt scale because I expected to be more than two volts, but you know, less than 20. So that should give me a good reading, positive and negative. 12.3 volts. So he's about 75% state of charge. So he's, he's doing pretty good, but he definitely needs to be charged up. 12.6 would be 100% state of charge. Now, um, what you'll find is these batteries, if, if you allow them to get below about 10 volts, you're really going to take away from the lifespan of that battery. They want to stay fully charged most all the time. Let's see if I can get this on the camera just a little bit better. Um, <clears throat> again, if I select the wrong scale, it's not going to work. If I select the scale that's too high, I'm going to lose some accuracy. All right. So if I select the 500 volt scale, you know, it really rounds it down. Right. But if I select the right scale, I get some of that accuracy back. So 12.29. Now, if I get the polarity wrong, here's what I love about a digital meter. It doesn't matter about um, polarity. I'm trying to get that on the screen a little bit. I've just looked up re reverse polarity. All that happens is I get a little minus sign right there. No big deal. So most of the time, I don't even worry about polarity. I'm worried more about the numbers on the screen because polarity is not a big deal for most of what we're doing. So. 12.3 volts. Okay, this battery is low on charge. I need to charge it up um, before I test it. Um, so anyways, there, there's some voltage measurements. I do want to show you one last thing. If I selected volts AC, this would screw me up because it's looking for alternating current back and forth, and I don't have it. I have direct current. So it shows zero volts because I've set it to AC. But if I plugged it into my wall circuit, it would show me uh, voltage at my wall circuit. So in fact, that's, that's what we'll do because I have a good set of leads in here. I have a good meter that has a good enough category rating. So let's see if I can grab some power here and get to my... to my plug. There's the other. And look at that. 121 volts. So remember I said a wall out's going to have 120 volts. 121 volts AC. Now, I would not do that with the Harbor Freight Tools meter for less than 10 bucks. This one was $2 more, but he's got a much better category rating, which means he's safe to go to uh, 300 volts. Um, so I feel comfortable doing that with this meter. Um, uh, so anyways, 100. now if I went to DC, he's not gonna show anything. So again, this could, you, you know, if you had this meter set wrong and you're doing electrical work on your house, and you measure the voltage and he set right here, you think, oh, okay, the circuit breaker turned off. I'm cool. I'm ready to work on it. And boom, you're not because you really have 120 volts there. So, you know, you when you're getting into electrical work, you really have to pay attention to how you have your meter set up and do you really know how to use that thing? Because relying on this 
for your test results. And sometimes you're relying on this meter for your own personal safety. So you really, really have to pay close attention to what you're doing and feel confident with that meter. So I just wanted to demonstrate some different electrical tests today as we kind of finish things off in our class. Um, and what I like about learning elect about electrical is that, hey, electricity is electricity. So the same concepts I, we talked about today would apply to a small engine, would apply to a car, can apply to a house. I mean, it's just, I used our cell phones as an example. All right. So um, to finish to finish everything off, what I want to do now, guys, as we as we wrap up our class today and kind of start wrapping things up for this for our whole uh, summer semester, is if you haven't already done it, most of you guys have is is do the bronze magneto operation, right? That's a if I have an ignition system that has no battery, it uses magnets. It's a magneto style ignition system. So do that bronze training, get that done. Um, and if we get our uh, class going again, here we are in our small engine class. Uh, you can get to the different things that you have to do a number of different ways. You could go through the modules and make sure you get you know everything done in all these modules. So here we are on our last module, module five. Um, another thing, another way you could do this though, is we could go back and we could do assignments, and you can just start looking at what assignments are coming up or when they're due. But uh, maybe maybe one of the best ways is is. You know, grades are coming up. I want you guys to use this grades tab to see where you're at. So this is my student login. So I haven't done assignments as under my student login. So you can see it's missing all kinds of things, but it shows you what you did, what your score is, how many points it was out of. And at the end of this thing, at the bottom, it'll tell you your total percentage in the class. Now in our class, you know, uh, 90 to 100% is an A. 80 to 89 is a B. Um, if you're close, like when in doubt, let's say you're at 89.6%, I'm going to round that up to a 90 for an A. I always uh, round round you guys up like that. Um, but you can see like what's, uh, you know, we have some extra credit stuff that's, uh, uh, you know, opened up again, some stuff that's due. What I should do is extend... Um, extend these dates out to give you a little bit more time on these ones that are the ignitions and uh, engine disassembly labeling. And so I'll go ahead and do that uh, right right now. Um, let's see, how can I do that? We'll get that done and then I'll get, I see there's a question on the chat, I'll get that real quick. So let me go to assignments and let's do this right now while I'm thinking about it, guys. Leave my student view. Sometimes I, you know, I've been logged in to Canvas for a while. I have had the, the, the things happen before where if I stayed logged in too long and then I did a change, it didn't always save my change. Like I tried to reopen these extra credit things a couple of times and it didn't work till the second time of me doing it. So thank you for you guys um, uh, letting me know about that so I could go back in. So uh, what are we going to do? We're going to do the... Uh, ignition let's open this up let's edit it let's change that date and we're going to get rid of or we're going to change this due date um, and put this out let's see july extend this out till friday we'll do everything oh that's why it's doing that because technically the class ends on Thursday. Well, that has it ending today. Hang on. See if I could change this. Sometimes Canvas is pretty tricky. And I just wanted to kind of show you that it's tricky for us instructors as well. So I know for you guys, it's... Uh, it's tricky. So, okay, here we, I should be able to, to fake it out. 
So even though this is not right, if you look in the in the catalog, I'm going to update that so it doesn't end till Saturday. So that should enable me to change that grade due date to Friday for you. Let's try assignments. Let's see if we can fix it. Um, electrical. Edit. Save. And we'll do that still one as well. Edit and finally save. Where is it? There it is. Okay, awesome. So we got those. Uh, there's probably a couple more that, that I need to go in there and adjust a little bit. Like I said, the way the way this thing defaults out, it defaulted out to where today was our last Zoom and it was our last day. But we'll get that stuff um, finished out for you. Your big project is taking apart an engine, laying out the parts and pieces. I'll make sure I extend that, that due date out through the weekend as well. The extra credit modules are all open for you guys to do. Um, so that's that stuff should all be set up for you. Now let me um, let me change my uh, screen share here. Um, okay, and the question is, hey, is there is there a final is there a final exam? No, I you know originally I did have a final exam, and I felt like I had tested you guys so much with all these different certifications, I ended up doing away with it because I felt like I just beat you up too much with too many tests. And I felt like your your hands on projects was really your test. Like if you could take an engine that wasn't running well and you get it running better, you know, that's really a test of your skills. Or if you can take that four cycle engine or two cycle engine and take it all apart and label all the parts, that's a great test of your skills. Um, and so I didn't want to give you more tests than that because you guys have been taking tests all, all throughout this class. So yeah, there, Tim had asked the question, is there a final? No, there, there's there's no traditional hundred question uh, final exam. Um, when I do the class in like an in-person format in a little bit more traditional style, I usually do a final, uh, but we're not doing that for this one. So good question. Thanks for asking, uh, Tim. I appreciate it. So have, can you hear me, Professor yeah, French? I got gotcha. you. I have I have another question. Okay. The, the engine disassembly. I yep. followed along with yours that you had the video of. Yep, yep. And then I took a lot of pictures and turned it in, but the video was too long to submit to Canvas, so I emailed it to you. I I got that email, and um, I couldn't play it on one com uh, on my the computer I like the computer I'm on right now. For some reason, I couldn't play it, but I was able to play it off of my MacBook. So I got it. I need to put the points in there. I haven't had a chance to do that, but I did get your video. So great you job. My, uh, yeah, I've, I've run into that before. Um, sometimes what I've had uh, students do is they have to, you know, throw it up on a Dropbox or a Google Drive and give me a link or post it to YouTube and you can do that on like a private link. But yeah, whenever you're trying to do a large video, it's a pain. So um, images for that assignment work fine as well. And, and you and you put those on there. So anyways, I'll get you the points. You did an excellent job with that. Right on. That was really <laughs> And um, I, I just felt like that activity alone was kind of a great test of your skills um, overall. So and did you see my I, chainsaw video? File. What's that? Did you see my chainsaw video? Yeah, yeah, that was pretty. I couldn't. I was. I was a little bit stressed in that I couldn't play it for a few days. But um, like I said, I finally tried a different computer and got it to work. So. Um, you know, thus the joys of uh, online learning, right? But um, anyways, really good job with that. Really good job in the class, guys. Thank you for being with me this summer and in class today. Um, if you have any other questions or anything, shoot me some emails. Okay. I'll, be, I'll be there for you. Um, I appreciate it. Um, you'll also see uh, bonus points adding into your scores for attending these Zoom sessions because I certainly appreciate you guys being here. Um, so you guys get some bonus points from that. And then I should have your um, 
grades up and uh, calculated uh, by this weekend. And I'll keep tweaking on this Canvas page to make sure that even after the course is closed, that you'll be able to see what your grade is, uh, you know, through the weekend before I have to post it to or send it forward to the college to the administration office. Um, I believe I will have to do that like next Wednesday. Um, so I'll make sure that I can figure out a way to keep Canvas open so you can go into the grades tab. You can see what your grade is. Uh, contact mm -hmm. me if there's a problem or do some extra credit if there's something that you want to do. And, and we can get that up before I get them sent in. Okay. Um, thank you, Professor French. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. You guys take care. All right. I appreciate it. See you later.